Report for uh, CardoDB. I'm going to be talking about machine learning this morning. Um, I have rescoped this talk like three times this week. It's really hard to figure out where to pitch this. So I just wanted at the start to ask you guys a couple of questions to get a feel for kind of what the room is like. Um, who here has ever used a machine learning model? And I think pretty much everybody can put their hand up because you all have. You just don't know it. Um, uh, who here has actually built a machine learning model before? Less. Okay, that's good. That's where I thought things were. Um, okay, so the whole um, point of this talk today, I decided, is to get you guys excited about machine learning, to get it in your head that it's a real tool you can use from your toolbox, to give you some like introductory um, sort of routes into machine learning, and just kind of get like a sort of a common vocabulary that you can use to go out there and actually take the next steps with this. I'm really about it, excited about machine learning, especially in the geospatial world, about the things it can do, um, and I really want to impart that to you guys and then give you the tools to move ahead with that. So that's kind of the scope of this talk this morning. Um, at CardoDB, we're tr playing around with using this in a lot of different ways. I'll touch on that um, a little bit as we go through the talk. Um, but I really wanted to start, first start out with some like really big examples of this and what it can do. So it's a really exciting time in the like, world of machine learning just now because there's a lot of companies putting a lot of weight and a lot of money behind this. But also there's a lot of open source tools being developed and a lot of really good applications to being developed as well. Facebook recently partnered with the um, Connectivity Lab to do this amazing project where they were using satellite images and putting it through a machine learning algorithm that they had developed to pick out high resolution population maps of the world. So to give you an idea of just how good this is, this is one of the uh, images they, they looked at. And they trained the machine learning algorithm to basically find buildings and images like this um, and to treat those as basically a tracer of population. Um, the kind of the, um, the level at which we had a resolution of population um, before this project is kind of like at this level for um, the CIESNI um, uh, project at Columbia. This is the world pop population map of that area. And then the, training, the machine learning model that they trained was able to get down to this kind of resolution, which is pretty impressive. And this is a huge deal, right? Having a population layer of the world at this resolution is a huge thing. And this is a model that was trained, built, and run by Facebook in connection with the Connectivity Lab. Um, but everything that they did, we can, you can probably start building your own laptop. They just have a lot more computing power resources to you guys. Another really good example recently that I thought was interesting um, to bring up was uh, Google AI's um, uh, project to figure out where on earth a photograph was taken. And again, this is a really impressive um, use of machine learning algorithms. Um, also, there's another um, impressive use of machine learning algorithms on this page, which is this. Um, I, I was like doing this talk last night, and Mammoth pointed out to me that they're advertising Mapbox to me. Um, obviously, there's an algorithm running somewhere that's monitoring what I look at online, what I'm interested in, and it's suggesting that I use Mapbox. And this is a good example of where machine learning algorithms can go wrong because it doesn't know I work for CardoDB, and therefore, you know, I, we have our own software and things. So it, they're not perfect, and they don't take into account every sort of piece of information, but it's good enough to be able to recommend things like this. Um, the Google project called um, Planet. What it did was it basically took a whole bunch of Flickr photographs and it divided up the world into cells depending on how many Flickr photographs had been taken there. So it sort of looks something like this. Um, you can see here the middle picture there is of the UK. And where there's more photographs taken, there's a smaller cell. And basically the, the algorithm was trying to figure out, given a photograph, um, which one of these cells that photograph was taken in. Really simple problem, just one to the next. But it's hard to get computers to do that. Um, and it trained it using a lot of Flickr photographs, and then you can basically sort of feed through other images. So if you look here, these are the kind of the, the top five um, images for each one of these areas, the ones that were able to figure out where it was. And you can see here for the Galapagos Islands, what it's identifying is animals, which is weird. Like, it's, it's identifying these animals and these species, and it's, it's somehow learned the fact that these animals and species are present on the Galapagos Islands, and is a, therefore able to see that photograph came from, came from the Galapagos Islands which is sort of insane, right? That's kind of crazy that a computer can do that. Um, to give you an idea um, of the kind of features it can use, these are all put, um, pictures that it protected correctly where they were. And you can see at the top level, you can see some things here where um, it's picking out landmarks. Um, so the, the algorithm's learned that the Statue of Liberty, it's learned, first of all, what the Statue of Liberty is, and it's learned where it is in the world. It's learned it's in New York, which is sort of really kind of magical. Um, but you can also see if you go down here, the bottom layer here is um, kind of way, way more esoteric images. So for example, it correctly placed that picture of two horses in Iceland, because um, those are horses that are like, the type you find in Iceland. It's correctly um, picked out that my home country of Scotland is a bleak and desolate place with much um, heather and rain and um, like cloudy things. Um, and it's pretty awesome. Um, 
It does, of course, get some things wrong. So for example, here on the left-hand side, there's a picture of a car where the prediction was that it was in Havana, Cuba, um, but it was actually from Long Beach, USA. But looking at that car, like us as humans would look at that and think, yeah, I could see how that could be from Havana, Cuba. So it's not perfect, it's not magic, but it's able to do things that are pretty good. And again, like this one in the middle here is predicted that it's Scotland, um, but it's actually Alaska. So apparently all just desolate places in the world are now Scotland, which is mildly offensive. <laughs> Never mind. Um, so to give you an idea of how good this was, it was able to locate 3.6 of the images to street level accuracy, um, 10.1 to the city level accuracy, and 28.4 to the um, country level accuracy, and 4 to 8 at the continent level, which is pretty good. And this is actually way better than humans. If you actually give this task to humans, even well-traveled humans, who know a lot of the world, they, this is outperforming humans. So this is actually a superhuman um, machine learning algorithm, which is pretty cool. Another article I point to to get people excited about um, uh, machine learning is this one. It's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks. It's one of my favorite blog posts about this topic. A recurrent neural network is a network that can learn sequences of things. Um, and what you can do is you can feed it language letter by letter, or you can get a whole corpus of text, say something like all the works of William Shakespeare, and you feed it that, that corpus text by text, and then at the end of it, you ask it to create new text for you. And so what we have here is some output from that algorithm um, being trained on, I think it was um, Shakespeare. Um, after 100 iterations, it's producing gobbledygook. There's nothing there. After 300 iterations, it's beginning to work out how punctuation works, which is kind of cool. There's like quotation marks at close. There's full stops. There's capitalization after full stops. After 500 iterations, we start to see words. Um, and perhaps even like sort of like basic sentences. So he started out one offler, the consciousness that was still garbage. Um, after 700 iterations, we begin to see way more coherent sentences. And then finally, at the end, after 1,200 sorry, 1,200 iterations, we see things like this. So like you know, speech marks with like you know, um, bangs at the end, um, and like little bits of conversation back and forwards. And finally, we get to something like this, which is like. Why do what the day replied Natasha and wishing to himself the fact that the princess, Princess Mary, Mary was easier fed into a lot of them. So it's still garbage, but you could imagine that's actually text, right? Which is kind of cool. And remember, this algorithm is learning letter by letter. So it's had to first figure out what words are, the fact that words exist, how words go together, how punctuation works, and then how a global context comes in to give you things like speech patterns, which is cool. Even cooler is if you feed this algorithm um, if something like the Linux source code and ask it to generate you some source code, it makes something that looks like source code. It doesn't compile, but, <laughs> but, but come on, most of my code doesn't compile either. So like, you know, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So I did a quick experiment with this and I actually fed this algorithm um, GeoJSON. I fed it um, GeoJSON for all the buildings in New York and this is what it produced. It's not bad, right? It's learned things like there's always uh, properties and type um, keys. It's learned things like there's an OSM ID for each object that's there. And again, this doesn't create ge like working GeoJSON, but it's, I think it's just amazing that this algorithm even begins to get the, the right idea of the structure. There's also some really cool places, people doing this which are, who are not machine learners. There's a lot of artists who um, play around with machine learning algorithms. This is one of my favorite. This is a project um, which is um, using machine learning algorithms to basically transport artistic styles onto photographs. And there's actually a, a website called deepart.io where you can go and do this with your own photographs. Um, and what it can do is take an example image, another painting, and it combines them together using neural networks. It's really beautiful and really cool. One of my favorite artistic neural network pro uh, projects is this one here, and hopefully this will play. This is somebody who trained a machine learning algorithm to recognize Chinese symbols and then was able to generate new Chinese symbols for different concepts um, uh, just by interpolating between the two different symbols in the, in the model. This is really cool because you know, Chinese symbols are all picto uh, pictographic based and there's often ways you can combine them together to produce um, new pictographs. And so in this case, what they're doing is they're getting the machine learning algorithm to do that. And again, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful, like, cool idea. Um, this is all just to get you excited. We'll talk about more practical solutions in a second. So why is machine learning and geo, um, geo a good fit? Um, you know, why, why do we use this? Why, why should we be using this rather than other methods that we have, like geospatial statistics or sort of old school kind of um, kerning type algorithms? Well, machine learning tends to work best when we have a lot of variables. So a lot of input data, so a lot of different um, variables that we can characterize as a place. And of course, with geo, that's definitely the case. With geo, we have things like the census, we have land mass cover, we have everything else. When you put a point down on a map, you're driving that point through an incredible number of layers that all give you information about that point. And so there's a lot of information there, a lot of variables there to use in um, machine learning. It works when we've got lots of data, and we do. Like we have, if you think about something again, like the U.S. Census, there's data for every single block group in the U.S., which is a huge amount. And so that can be really, really valuable for us. 
it's fairly robust. Once you get a good model, um, as long as your underlying assumptions of the data set don't change that much, it will keep predicting things relatively correctly for a long time. It's non-linear, which is important because most things in geo, geo are non-linear. So if, it's not as if, if you double the number of people who are um, aged 50 to 60, that's going to have a linear effect on the number of people who have cancer in your area, for example. And so it can capture non-linear relationships between variables, which is hugely important. And it's model-free, which is kind of a plus and a negative. So by that, I mean that we don't have to understand or don't have, we have to have a working model of how we think different variables come together to give us an answer. So for example, you could create a model where you say, I think that um, somebody's age, their gender, and their income are all important for predicting whether or not they're going to get cancer or not. And this is how I think they go together in a, a framework that I'm basing upon my knowledge and understanding of medicine. Um, it's not like that. You put the data in, and you get a prediction out. And it's kind of a black box in the middle. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a bad thing because it doesn't give you that much insight into the problem. But it's a good thing because um, it means that you don't have to be necessarily be an expert in that subject matter. And for us at CaroDB, where we want to enable people to use these kind of models um, consistently and well in their, their projects, that's a really big positive. Because we don't, want, we don't want people to have to sit down and click about a complicated model. We can give predictions basically just using the data. And that's kind of the learning part of machine learning. It's, 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 it's inferring the relationships from the data itself, not from being told by an outside source. So what is machine learning? Well, it's not magic. It seems like magic a lot of the time, but it's not magic. Um, it's not even really learning. Um, it's actually kind of just like fitting a, a model to a data space. So we've all probably at school done the fitting of a straight line to data points, yeah? Most people? That boring thing you do in statistics class where you do like a linear regression, like there's basically that, but for more complicated models. And that's, that's all it's really doing. I'm going to talk about two different types of machine learning today very quickly. Um, one is supervised machine learning and one is unsupervised machine learning, and I'll give examples of both. But let's start with supervised machine learning. The kind of things you'll see in this space are uh, random forests, neural networks, and support vector machines. So when you see those things, you're kind of doing, you're in the kind of um, uh, supervised machine learning uh, model. You can use some of these to do unsupervised as well, but you're kind of sort of in that space. And the idea here is that we have a model, um, which is F, which takes a bunch of input variables. And we want to train that model to, to output the predictions that we want, which are the Ys. So we put in X, and we want to get out Ys. And the way we do that is that we take this feature set, X, which could be pixels of an image. It could be census data about an area. It could be data about car crashes. It's basically the stuff we know, basically the stuff we have in our back pocket and we'll always know. And then what we do is we have these Ys, which are the outputs, which could be labels for the data, which, and for example, the case of the Google, um, where was this picture taken? labels there are the labels for where that image was taken. It could be a probability of some event. So it could be like, how probable is it that somebody from this area is going to have cancer? Um, it could be a vector of a whole bunch of different values. Um, but it's basically the output. And so what we do is we take many examples of x for which we know y. Um, we take the model, and we start out with a model that's completely wrong. The internals of the model are all over the place. It doesn't predict anything. We shove through our um, x's, and we get out a set of predictions for y. So we now have a whole bunch of predictions that the model's made for y, and we've got the actual values that we've measured from the real world. Then what we do is we see how far off we are. We use something called an error function to tell how far off the model was from getting things right. And then the really smart part is that we tweak the model. We go back into the model, and we change a bunch of things. And this is the really smart part where there's a lot of computer science research about how you do that, um, to be better, to reduce the error a little bit. And you keep doing that over and over and over and over again. And eventually, your model gets better and better. And you reduce the error to the point whereby you're happy, or it doesn't work, and you can just give up and go and do something else. Um, and that's kind of the basic idea. We also re reserve some test data, and this is really important. Test data is important because test data, um, if you train on just like a, a set of um, training data over and over and over again, sometimes what machine learning algorithms can do is they can be greedy, and they just kind of learn the right answer. It's kind of like cheating for a test. You know how like in school, tests are meant to then determine whether or not you actually know a subject. But actually, if you just memorize the answers to everything, you can just put them through. And so that's not useful. Just memorizing the answers is not great. And so the, the algorithms can sometimes just learn answers, which is not what you want. And so what we do is we hold back some knowledge from the machine learning model and use that to test it later on to make sure that we're actually getting a generalized idea and understanding of the world rather than just learning stuff. And so we can see one of these models here. Um, let me just open up this URL. And this is a really fun thing to play with. This is a neural network model that you can run in your browser. And what we're trying to get this neural network model to do is we're putting in two values, x1 and x2, which are the x and y axis here. And we're oh, no, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Oh, you can see that with my messy desktop. Um, so we're putting in uh, two variables, x and y, which are the, the, the x coordinate here and the y coordinate here of these points. And what we're asking the model to do is tell us whether this point should be blue or yellow. And so what we can do is we train this. And what you're going to see 
is the background of this image shows you its prediction. So that's how it's working. So basically what you're seeing here in the top corner is the wasp function, the error function is getting more and more accurate. Let me just run that again. And as we go through that iteration of training over and over again, it correctly identifies the spaces where things are blue and where things are yellow. And that's basically all we're doing with machine learning is trying to create those boundaries for, for different classes or different um, models that are there. This is super fun to play with. Um, don't load it up now because you won't listen to anything else I say in the rest of this talk, but I can recommend checking it out. Um, I'll put the slides up later on. And so let's give a real world example of this that's actually really important to Geo. This is a project that was done by a company called Enigma in New York who we're good friends with. And they were interested in the question of where, should, where can we find people who are at high risk of not having a smoke alarm? And this is a really real problem. They were working with New Orleans City Council to do this. There's been a lot of deaths of fires in New Orleans over the past few years. And so they wanted to target um, a, a free um, smoke detector problem there. This is the map they produced. This is the prediction. Um, and you can see it's down to the census tract level. And the way they did this was they, they were looking for a target variable Y, which is the fraction of people who have a smoke alarm in their home. And this is actually a question that's asked in the American Housing Survey, which is a great survey. Um, but it's actually, the American Housing Survey is at quite high geographic resolution. So there's not very much detail. It's kind of at the Pumas level. So there's not a lot of like geo specification and the answers to that question. So what they did was they took the answers from there. They took other answers in the American Housing Survey that also were in the American Community Survey, which is much higher resolution geographically. And they trained a the machine learning model using the overlap of those two questions to predict whether people were going to have a smoke alarm or not. And then they applied that to the American Community Survey to basically take this knowledge from one level and transpose it down to another level, which is pretty cool. Um, and again, they were able to do pretty well with this. And so this is a really interesting use case, which is pretty cool. They actually used a machine learning model called a random forest, which is worth mentioning. A random forest tries to create a whole bunch of um, decisions based upon the input variables. So for example, if your age is less than 20 and your income's less than 200K, it may, you may be at risk. If your income's greater than that, it may be not at risk. And this is a really interesting model that's worth looking at because it gives you insight into what the variables that are important to have are in your model. And so this actually allows you to tell a little bit about what the model's doing, which is really cool and really interesting. So if you're trying to train a model, start, always, start, always start with a, a, a random forest because it's way easier to see what's happening in that model than as almost any other ones. So how do we, how would we do this? How would we recreate, recreate this? Well, it turns out there's a really amazing Python library called scikit-learn, where a lot of this work has already been done for you. And it's got a really good API, a really good interface. Um, to do a model like the one we just saw with the random forest, this is basically all the code you need, which is pretty cool. So what we're doing is we're, we're importing some stuff from scikit-learn, we're loading in the features, we're loading in the targets, and we're splitting those up into a testing and a training group, and then what we're doing is we're creating a random forest classifier, we're fitting it, and then we're predicting the results. Super easy. And this is what's really exciting about machine learning now. There's a lot of libraries that make it very, very simple to try and simple to do. So I can encourage you all after this talk to go home and try and train a, a machine learning model. Just give it a go and see data you have. As I was saying before, the great thing about random forest is that it gives you this kind of like um, uh, ranking of how important each one of the variables in your data set was to making the decision. And so for this one, you can see that um, income, race, and when your house was built are all huge predictors of whether you have a smoke alarm or not, which is pretty cool. And so you can get uh, this kind of deeper insight from the model as well. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry. I stole it from the paper, so it wasn't a great high resolution image. We are trying to do this at CardoDB, make it um, really, really easy to do this by in integrating this with um, PostgreSQL. So that if anybody came to my talk yesterday, you'll know that we're building out an extension called Crankshaft, which is enabling Python to be used in the, the database. And one of the functions we're creating there is this um, create and predict segment. And the idea behind this is, if I can clear this really quickly, hopefully this is gonna play. Maybe not. That's a shame. This is meant to be a video. All right, well, if you wanted to see that, I can show you guys later on. Um, but basically, we're trying to enable people to take data, um, uh, join it with the census, train a model in that census data, and then predict it for a new area. And so what you'd be able to do is transpose information from one place in the world to another. It's gonna be pretty cool. And it'd be really great if this video worked. No, it should be the entire thing. It doesn't matter, let's go on. Anyway, okay, so that's supervised machine learning. So supervised machine learning works when you have, you already have examples of the outcome. Unsupervised machine learning is the opposite. Unsupervised machine learning is when you don't know the answers to the question you're trying to ask. And what you're trying to do is basically put things into groups, put things into bu uh, buckets. And so um, really you'll see things like key means clustering and reinforcement learning are the models that people use here. Um, and basically it's trying to tell us, trying to find natural groupings of things. And so hopefully this will work. So let's say we have um, a whole bunch of data points. Um, along the x-axis is somebody's age, and on the y-axis is their enjoyment of the music of Bob Dylan. Um, and so we have this like space of variables that describes a person. 
Now, naively, you can probably see that there's roughly four clusters in there. There's roughly four clusterings of people. And so what we can do with k-means um, is we can create um, those clusters by picking four random points to represent the centers of the clusters. We assign all the points that are in there um, to their nearest um, cluster center. We move the cluster centers to the center of all those points, and then we iterate that over and over and over again. It's a really simple algorithm. Um, and basically what this does is over time, it gradually finds the center points of those clusters and assigns all those points to those clusters. Um, so now what we end up with is four labels for these points. Um, at this point, each point has a label, and we have to give them uh, meaning. So we go through it, and we're like, these are middle-aged people, uh, middle people with taste, these are hipsters, um, these are original fans, and these are middle-aged people without taste. Um, and so like, <laughs> this is actually really useful when it comes to geo, because this is, this is actually how we tend to think about people, right? We don't, like, if you, if you, um, if you think about... Uh, Geospatial stuff, um, and especially with like uh, social social stuff, we don't think about people as the row and the column of the census that they are. We don't think about them as their medium income, their ethnicity, their blah, their blah, their blah, their, the, the other hundred columns that are in the census. And so often, what we want to do is we want to have um, a description of people um, that is much more like a human description. So if I showed you this picture here from New York, um, would anybody like to have a go at describing what this neighborhood is like? Hipsters, yeah, this is definitely a hipster neighborhood. This is then where our office is in New York. Um, so bicycles, um, people um, wearing not business clothes, um, murals on walls, you get a feel for it, and you understand intuitively what that means. Um, compared to this, for example, um, which is a little bit different, um, this is maybe a segment of, you know, like, young, um, like, middle incomes of mothers out, like, running with a, their, 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 their buggies. There's a, there's a neighborhood in Chicago where I was for the past five years called um, Lincoln Square, and me and my friends were walking around one day trying to figure out what the flags for all the different Chicago neighborhoods would be, and we came up with the, the idea that this Lincoln Square neighborhood should be a, a pregnant um, a woman doing yoga in the middle of the street, and then we turned the corner, and there was a pregnant woman doing yoga in the middle of the street, and so it was like, it was a weird coincidence, but it was, it was like, I gave you an idea that we, we really do think this way. And so at Carlos we've been working with some, um, some researchers from Liverpool um, who have tried to do this with the, the American um, census, um, basically trying to find these kind of like higher level groups within the census. And they're doing that for a couple of different reasons. One is that this is really useful. You know, Esri has a, their, their tapestry product. Um, there's a couple of other, uh, or from like Pitney Bowes, where you get these social geographic, social geographic um, segments of people. Um, we wanted to use this one because it's completely open and transparent. So we understand exactly how we get to these answers. And people can rerun this if they want and get different answers. But it's open and transparent and um, completely open source. And so what this does is it tries to find those clusters. It actually uses a version of that kind of k-means clustering that's hierarchical. So it produces a, a, a list of 50 different categories. And then it, it groups those together into a list of 10, uh, 33 categories. And then it groups those together into a list of 10 categories. And so what we're doing here is we're taking all the data in the census, all the variables, instead of just having two variables, the age and the music of Bob Dylan, it's like every single variable in the census. And we're clustering them together into groups. And then we're going through and looking at those groups. And we're kind of naming them to see what kind of um, like, like properties are there. Um, so if you do this, um, this is what the US looks like in that clustering. Most places are middle income, single family homes across the, the, the border of the US. I should say, again, this is the 10 category group. We have a 55 category group that I'll show in a second, but we haven't named everything in it. That's actually what I'm doing after this talk, is going through all those categories and trying to name them. Um, but we can zoom into cities, and we see things like this. So this is Chicago. Um, we can see um, that there's very distinct neighborhoods in Chicago, and Chicago is famously like one of the most segregated cities. And so you can begin to pick out areas where people are falling into these different geo demographic categories. This is what New York looks like, which is pretty cool. And then this is a heat map showing uh, the, the rows here are each a column in the, um, the census. And the columns themselves are the different groups, the 55 different groups that we've segmented this into. And so you can see there's a lot of rich structure here. And you really can pick out distinct groups of people from this, this kind of clustering analysis, which is pretty cool. And those 55 different um, categories on the map look like this. I, if anybody has a better idea of how to do 55 distinct colors on the map, let me know, because I have no idea. I just randomly grabbed 55 colors and threw them on here to sort of have something to show. Um, I, I think Mamatha, our, our cartographer who spoke a couple of days ago, cries when she sees this, because I don't know. It's just not clear to how you, how you do this. And again, we're exposing this in CardoDB using a little SQL function, uh, which we've written called um, Observatory Get Segment uh, Segmentation Snapshot. So you give this a point, and what it will return is it will return the geodemographic segment along with information from the census about what that segment looks like in terms of its, um, its quantiles. And this is really important. So for example, our office um, is uh, classified as wealthy, urban, and without kids, which is fairly accurate for our office. Very few of us have kids. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really rich um, 
uh, structure here and things to go with. I, I really wanted to leave you guys with some resources about how to like take this and go and do it yourself because I think that everybody should be playing around with this. Think about this as a tool, just like um, you know, uh, you know, like the tools we have for doing overlapping shapes within Postgres. It's, it's just a tool that you have that you can do some really interesting things with. Um, so in terms of libraries. There's a bunch of libraries that are really worth knowing about. Um, Scikit-learn is the one that I would start with. Um, Scikit-learn is a really, really solid library for doing this stuff. It is a very consistent, very easy to use interface. Um, and there's lots of documentation about how to do that. Scikit-learn basically wraps up a whole bunch of different types of machine learning models and, and, a, and a, a similar interface. So they all have that pattern where it's like um, fit this data and then predict this data. Um, and so that's really useful. You can actually tell it to just go and train uh, your machine learning algorithms on every type of algorithm there is and pick the best one, which is nice, so you to, don't even have to think about it that much. Um, TensorFlow is the big library that Google released recently. This is how they do their own machine learning internally, and they released this library um, as open source, which is a really interesting indication. A lot of people are saying that this is an indication that what matters in machine learning is how much data you have, not the technology that you have, and I think that's definitely true. Um, so TensorFlow, they released, um, it could have given all their competitors a huge competitor advantage, but the advantage that Google has is that it has an insane number of pictures of cats, right? And it has the same number of pictures of um, like, you know, places in the world, and it has an insane number of pieces of data. And so for, for those large companies, for those big projects, you really do need that. But I think what I'd encourage you guys to do is even if you have a small or medium-sized like, set of data, give this a try, see how accurate you get, see how useful it can be, because this really is like a no-brainer. You can, you can write these things up in like a couple of hours once you get good at this, and then you, you may have a model that you can use to be very useful for your future practice. Um, Keras, then the bottom left hand here, is a library that's built on top of TensorFlow, um, or Theano, which is another kind of open source version of TensorFlow. Um, and it allows you to create neural networks, these kind of very newfangled, um, interesting, deep neural networks, which I haven't, I haven't really talked about today, but if anybody wants to ask me about them, you can later on. Um, and it can like, do that very easily. Again, a very few of the small number of lines of code. And finally, OpenCV is a great way of doing I've talked a lot about um, machine learning on data, but not necessarily on images, because I think that and community within the geospatial community has a much better understanding of how to do this stuff. But OpenCV is, is a bunch of algorithms to do um, computer vision on images. Then what that can do is it can help you get a bunch of features, so the X's, to go into a model to train something. And so it's, it's really useful to use that to get to get started and get things up. Um, there's also a lot of learning resources out there that I really wanted to call attention to. Um, there's this amazing blog post by a guy called Michael Nielsen, who I'm a, a huge fan of. Um, he has this, um, basically it's an online book at this point um, called Neural Networks and Deep Learning, where he goes through in a very intuitive and very um, you know, steady and even handed and easy to understand way how neural networks work and how we train them and how they learn. It's really worth a read. Um, I can recommend it to everybody who's interested in this. There's a whole bunch of courses on Coursera about machine learning, which I can recommend highly. Um, they, they take you through the basics, they take you through how to train models. Um, there's a lot of subtleties I haven't touched upon today, like how do you make sure that the variables you're putting in are all scaled properly, how do you deal with outliers, how do you deal with X, Y, and Z, and these can all make your models better, um, but it's not something, to, I don't want to touch them today because I don't want to scare you guys and I want you guys to try this, so just be aware in mind that there's a lot more depth to what I'm talking about here today than, than I, I've covered, um, but you will start heading that as soon as you start using some of these resources and playing around with some of this stuff, um, and these kind of courses can really take you into detail with them. Um, one of my favorite sets of resources is this machine learning for artists um, because I think it's really focused on getting results and getting output rather than the internals and I think that's really useful as well. So I would check this out as well. They do some really cool stuff in here with um, convolutional neural networks with uh, Webkinner, which is a, a platform for machine learning and some other stuff in there, which is pretty cool. Um, there's also some mailing lists that I would check out. Um, data Elixir is a good one. It's one that kind of sends around resources for machine learning and data science in general um, every uh, week. Um, there's always something pretty cool in there and pretty interesting in there. And then there's also the open data science um, uh, like uh, community as well, which is really good, again, for just keeping up with this stuff. They hold conferences each year where you can go along and talk about this stuff. And finally, there's um, Udacity, which is, uh, Udacity has a course um, run by Google about TensorFlow and neural networks there, which is worth checking out. And finally, if you want to cut, cut your teeth in this, Kaggle is a great place to go. Kaggle is a website where people can put challenges in machine learning, and you can download the data. You can see what other people are doing to try and solve that problem, and you can try and take a go at it yourself. And then you upload your results, and they give you a score about how well you did. So this is actually a really good place to practice, cut your teeth, and get some experience on machine learning. And so I've got a couple of minutes, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, 
the one thing I do want to say is that I and I, I was this is what I was originally going to talk about before I de-scoped this talk a lot is that I think within the geospatial the, the machine learning world doesn't really think about the geospatial world very much and the the geo world doesn't really think about the machine learning world very much. Hopefully that will change now after I told you guys all this stuff because it's really cool. Um, but like it, it, there's not much crosstalk between those communities. And what that means is that when we train models um, on for machine learning, often we don't take into consideration the fact that places are spatially connected. And we all know this intuitively, right? Like we, we're all in geo because we understand that there's a spatial connectivity of data and information in the world. And so um, we're going to be running a project with um, some people who, the people who run PySAL and a, few, a couple other groups, to try and really demonstrate that if you take that extra information into account, those kind of what your neighborhood's doing rather than just what you're doing, that you can get better models. And so I'm going to like just flag that up as something that may be interesting to think about later on. But also like it's worth just checking this stuff out and trying it out. And so that's all I wanted to say. I hope I've like enthused you to go out and try this. I hope you can see that there's really good resources that it's easy to get going with, and that it can provide really good value really really quickly. And so with that, I'll ask you guys to. Ask any questions. Yeah, so the, 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 the question was how easy is it to, is it to use a, a library like um, Scikit-Learn with some of the kind of the, the distributed processing stuff that's out there for, for Python. It's actually fairly easy. I think, I think there's a Dask-based um, um, library that sits on top of Scikit-Learn that can do that stuff really easily. So Dask is a, is a parallelization tool for Python that basically breaks down problems into, um, into serializable components that can then be shipped out into like different CPUs or different clusters, and that's fairly easy. Um, I think I've come across a, a fair bit of uh, parallelization for it. Um, I think it's, it's definitely okay. I haven't seen much with it with Spark, but that may just be because I haven't gone looking for it. So um, I can, there's probably a lot of resources out there to try that out on. Um, the other thing to mention as well is that a lot of the neural network stuff and the TensorFlow stuff and the Keras stuff, which is, is like this new breed of machine learning software, it all can run on GPUs. Um, so that, that gives you a huge speed boost as well. Um, and that, that's really where a lot of this like, progress is coming from, is the fact that we have these really fast GPUs that can paralyze these processes really, really quickly. Yeah, question at the back. Totally. Yeah, totally, and, and that's a huge problem, right? Um, so for some machine learning algorithms, that's, that's more of a problem than others. Um, some are very good at, like, so the key means, for example, the clustering there. It's sensitive to outliers. It can, like, you can get trapped in that space. But because it's a means-based algorithm, you tend to sort of, like, ignore those and find the centers anyway. So, like, some algorithms, it's less of a problem for than others. And um, actually, weirdly, the census examples I was giving before, it's not particularly good data. Like, the sense, we think of the census as being this really good data set, but if you look at the margins of error for the data, they're actually pretty large. Um, and one of the things that's argued about in that, the paper I showed is that um, one of the things that machine learning like this can do and the clustering can do is that because you're using that data to create these larger categories, you're kind of averaging over the errors in that data. And so like, sometimes it can help you with that. Um, but also, like, yeah, you're right. Like, if you can make a clean input data set, that's the best thing to do. If you go to, um, if you go to uh, again, Scikit-Learn, there's a lot of tools in there to help you clean up data sets before they go into models. So there's, there's, there's tools in there to do things like remove um, any missing entries or, and to replace them with either the mean of the distribution or some sampling from the distribution, which can help you get rid of empty data, set, data points in there. There's um, tools in there to help you scale the data so that um, outliers are less of a problem. There's also methods in there to help you detect outliers and remove them from your data set. And so there's a lot of literature about how, what you do to pre-process data to go into machine learning algorithms that I didn't have time to go into today. But if you go to Scikit-Learn, they have an entire module there that's that full of stuff that's able to help with that. But you're right, like it's like garbage in, garbage out, right? Like you're always gonna find um, you're do better with better data and that's the data is really key. The nice thing about neural networks is because they're um, uh, nonlinear and because you're trading on the thing you specify that you want out, um, often they can sort of get rid of like outliers and noise and things. So random forest, for example, will just ignore variables that don't really contribute to your data or, or that are you know superfluous to it. So non-homogeneous data. Um, so the question was, how do you how do you deal with like lots of data sets that are trying to represent the same thing, but non-homogeneous data? Um, 
So I think what you can, what the, the way to work with that is to not use the data set as a raw data set, right? So um, what you want to do in that point, I think, is try and do some feature extraction, which is a huge um, field in like machine learning anyway. So feature extraction says what you want to do is you want to grab a set of features that are consistent, and you want to do that from multiple, you know, if you're doing that from multiple data sets, you create some heuristics to grab that out of that data set. So again, it's a lot of pre-processing to get it into good shape there. Um, you could try and run a model where you just put all that variables in and just set the models. The, the, the other, so if you've got two like, studies, you just put the different variables in and set the other ones to zero as you go in there. It might learn to, to cope with that and to deal with that. I mean, like a lot, a lot of this is trial and error, right? A lot of this is seeing what ha works and what doesn't work. And so I, that could be a good approach. I've never tried that. Um, but yeah, feature extraction is probably the better way to go there, is, is to actually like, process your data set and to actually index by features before you put it into the machine learning algorithm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally, and again, like, so the, so the response there was like sometimes the fact that you don't have data is actually data in itself is telling you something that's there. Um, and so you, again, that's feature extraction. You could use that to create a feature set, which again goes into the, the algorithm. Okay, I think I'm out of time. I'll be around if anybody wants to ask questions. Um, go ahead and try this. It's pretty fun. Play around. And then go. <laughs>